Welcome to the Zadzoops Happy Hour. My name is Todd Stoll, and I am joined by a 25-year veteran reporter covering pop culture, video games, and technology for the Washington Times, Joseph Zadkowski. Hello. <laughs> you at least got your polka. Um, yeah, I heard it. It's fantastic. Okay. You're going to lead with that now, right? Oh, I don't know. Maybe not this Come week. On. It's just so much work. We're sponsored by nobody. Yeah, well, that's okay. It's totally in line. You'll, you'll understand that joke someday. Yeah, someday. I want to bring it there. Well, hello. Um, hello. We're, we're going to talk today, Sausage Party. God, we're a little, I even hate saying that title. <laughs> we're a little late to the game. We'll talk X-Men <laughs> Apocalypse. We're really late to the game. Yeah. And... You, I can I can talk about... Did you see Finding Dory at the theaters? I have not seen Finding Dory. You didn't Dory. take I your didn't kids. No, they've seen it. I have not you seen it. You want to bring one of them down and talk about it? No, not really. Okay. Th- I saw it on... We might have negative listeners at that point. <laughs> or we might appeal to a 10-year-old crowd, no, which just, would be awesome. I just don't think so. Okay. Well, let's get into... I can s- talk about let's, that. Let's go to non-kid related right. material, and let's talk the hard R mm. sausage party. What do you mean hard R? Well, I mean that was what it was. Right. It was, it's not it an was... extended cut or anything, right? No. Okay. No. No. I think what was yeah. released was a theatrical version. I couldn't take an extended cut. Uh, yeah. I mean, okay. I watched it once, and it was amusing. And then I watched it a second time after watching all the extended uh, right. bonus material when I found out who was playing which characters and sort of getting involved in how they were voicing their characters. And the second time was way more enjoyable because you kind of knew who it was and you got a sense of how they were voicing their characters and the crazy things they were doing. Do you want to explain what it is? Sausage Party is an animated Pixar type movie. All right. It's not exactly Pixar quality. I think you'll. It's. I mean, no. It's not. It doesn't have the polish on it. But it's right. meant to be a Pixar style movie, right? That follows the lives of food, <laughs> and the food believe that when they are chosen by a human, that the humans are their gods, and when they leave the store, they are taken to the equivalent of, you know heaven or you know valhalla or whatever right and then they come to realize that maybe everything that they've thought is totally wrong and it is voiced uh the the main all-star cast all-star cast the main character is frank the sausage voiced by seth rogan a feisty hot dog a feisty hot dog (laughs) you have more Kristen wig yes she plays his significant other bun bun which there's a whole lot uh, that you can just only imagine yeah. which happens there michael sarah plays a sort of mutated sausage a smaller handicap sausage if you will jonah hill <laughs> also plays a sausage yes <laughs> danny mcbride in real life he plays a sausage i think <laughs> yeah. danny mcbride plays honey mustard you have Bill Hader, who plays Firewater, and he also plays... Yeah, it's Mexi- a bottle of, bottle of liquor. Bottle of liquor, and he also plays Mexican tequila. Yep. He plays both of those characters. You have Paul Rudd, who plays the store manager. Yes. And you have James Franco, who plays a stoner a drug addict in the real world. <laughs> right. Additionally, you have Edward Norton... Yes. Who plays Sammy Bagel Jr. Right. And he's a bagel. Doing a great Woody Allen impression. Which he does a phenomenal Woody Allen impression. Right. And Selma Hayek. And Selma Hayek, who plays oh my God. a lesbian taco. There you go. That pretty much sets the tone for That's, this film. That is an all-star cast, to say the yes. least. And Look how much money that made. Made $139 million. Yeah, and the budget was... was $19 million. $19 million. I mean... Wow. This is why Seth Rogen is so successful. They have bottom barrel budgets and monster box office. Right. And if we... So the animation was pretty decent. Yes. The tone of the movie was a little slow at first. 
Um, but not too bad. I think the, the length of the film was pretty adequate. I think it was fine. I don't think they really could have cut anything from it. There is a very NC-17 style... Finale? Finale, which he goes into detail on how they were able to get that approved. How were they able to get that approved? Apparently because... Okay, so the finale is basically all the food having relations with each other in a mass setting, the entire store. A buffet orgy, if you will. For sure. Yep. And apparently, because it is animated and because it's food, they can do anything they want. The review board didn't really know what to do with it. (laughs) So they literally had them pare down this one area where someone is grabbing a hold of someone else's nether regions and kind of shaking back and forth with them. Yeah. They literally reduced that scene down by maybe five seconds. And that's it. That was it. Wow. But again, it's food. It's animated food voiced by humans. <laughs> and the review board was like, we don't know how to do with this. And they lobbied that. Well, it's a cartoon. And my favorite part was the appearance of a singer who you would expect to see in a food-related movie. Meatloaf. <laughs> yes. So, and, it was, and he was in a tw- he was in two different times. Right. Did he ever even say anything? Or was it just his voice singing a I think song? It, it's just his voice. Yeah, but it was really but a it good was, idea. It was great. Right. It's such a great callback. Right. For sure. Um, moving on to the deleted scenes and the extras, you definitely get the Seth Rogen smorgasbord of... Linoramas. Linoramas. Gag reels. Everything. Extended scenes. Everything that you could want. And I think what was really very cool about this behind the scenes is that they go through the process on having each actor voice their characters and Seth is in the room with them. So they're able to, in some ways, communicate back and forth with him. But they also set GoPro cameras up focusing on the actors doing the voicing so that they could then take the video and send it back to the animation house to mirror the facial expressions of the actors on the animation, which I thought was very smart in how they did that. Right. Um, The animation company was a Canadian company that I had never heard of before, Um, and they did a really good job. I mean, and I think that was really smart, and they, of course, they were able to use the GoPro footage for the, you know, the extended... um, and additional, uh, you know, items on the the film itself, which was great. Um, and they speak to it at one point. So Nick Kroll plays the villain in this film, and he starts out um, apparently in the original iterations with a British accent, and instead, oh yeah, I remember that. And instead, he it doesn't really fit, and they have him come back in, and he uses a very over the top Jersey accent, right. very over the top. And that fits to a T. I mean, that is just exactly the voice for that character. Um, so the only thing that wasn't attached to this film that I would have liked to have seen was a um, commentary track with Rogan, um, which I think would have been in itself just a riot all the way through because it would basically be him just laughing at himself the entire time, which I always find amusing. Um, but, you know, I think the DVD itself was a good solid eight. Um, you saw it yeah, in four. You yeah. saw it in four K. How was that? Um, so it's upscaled. Obviously, I didn't get a four K copy of it. I was watching the Blu Ray. Um, you know, it looked great. It wasn't Pixar quality, but it certainly didn't detract me from enjoying what was going on on screen. You know, I wasn't looking at it like, oh my god, it's a uh, Batman cartoon or something. It was. It was above that. It was definitely. CGI quality for sure. Yeah, it was. It wasn't as bad as a Tom and Jerry style right cartoon, but it wasn't as good as Toy Story. That's right. Or Finding Dory. Finding Dory. That's right. Um, so, but you know, again, at nineteen million bucks, not that bad. I mean, it's amazing for a ridiculous premise. So, in the behind the scenes, he does talk about how they shopped this movie for years and couldn't find right, anyone. Nobody. And the, the woman who ended up financing it, I think she's 22, and 
just had sort of started doing this with films and became very wealthy as a result of it. Right. And she understood the premise and put the money up. So, and, and basically a Hollywood outsider financed this film and just made a ton of money in return. Right. For sure. Um, so I thought it was pretty good. I mean, it was a, it was entertaining again, watching it a second time, I think did add some perspective to it. Right. But, um, you know, I think it's worth a watch for sure. Yes, and now I think about it, the Blu-ray, um, I got to believe there are other bonus features out there on other versions, but I can't prove that. But anyway, the Blu-ray was a little short. It gave you what you needed, but you know, I've seen Seth like completely lose his mind on extras in like Neighbors. Oh, yeah. Um, Neighbors 2, where they'll just do hours of stuff. I would have enjoyed hours of stuff with this movie, for you know, to watch them do different alternate takes and stuff. And I have to wonder how much they really left, you know, cut and from the, the cutting film. room. Yeah, maybe not a lot. Right. Well, in animation, right, you can't really do that because the amount of time it takes to actually render a scene, you either got to have it or don't. Right. Right. You, you can go to the storyboard in the previs, but you don't want to start wasting money animating something you know isn't going to make it. Yeah, so, I, I think an alternate audio track with Seth Rogen or, you know... Right. Someone would have been great. Would have been great, or even some of the other actors. The one last thing that I will say that I found really bizarre is that Edward Norton was such a champion of this film that he yeah. was the first person on board, and he brought in Selma Hayek, and he brought in other actors because he's right. like, this is this is my film. And he really <laughs> championed this thing. And it's so bizarre to think of him as really just getting it and embracing it. And the fact that he's that close with those guys is also a little strange because it just doesn't seem like they follow right the fit. same crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he was very on board and was instrumental in bringing some of the cast you wouldn't normally see into it. Now, of course, Michael Sarah, Jonah Hill, Danny McBride, Seth Rogen, Thanks. James Franco, they're all together. Right. Bill Hader as well. You know, he's right. with those guys. But Selma Hayek, that's a pretty big way get. out there, yeah, right? And way she out was there. she was out there with her lines too. She had no problem diving into this role, not at all. And and I think a lot of it was ad libbed for sure. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty fun. Um, I agree. All right. Anything else on that one? Nope. All right. Well, should we take a break? Sure. We'll come back. We'll talk X Men Apocalypse, sure. which we're a little late on, but that's okay. That's okay. So we'll be back. Thank you. Communities Digital News, built by the writers and editors that deliver the news 24 hours a day. Visit comdiginews.com. That's C O M M D I G I news.com. And support the next evolution in news. Okay. Hey. What? Jeez. Scared me. Long break. Okay. Let's go to X Men Apocalypse. We're a little late, but that's okay. You know, sometimes it takes time to digest these it's things. It's still a great movie. It is a great movie. Um, it's a long movie. Yeah. Um, what was the runtime on it? Let's see. It 144 was... minutes. Yeah, okay. That... 144 minutes. That's a, that's a major evening. Yeah, that's okay. Sometimes you need a, you know, a good right. evening with the X-Men. So director Brian Singer, again, revisits the mutant universe and continues reshaping it, readapting it to his way. Thank God. His first one was set in the 60s. His next one was set in the 70s. The uh, first class I'm talking about. And now we're in the 80s. Yep. With um, Apocalypse. And, and this one stars Jennifer Lawrence, Michael Fassbender, James McAvoy. A lot of great, great mutants in this. Um, Almost some, in some ways too many to name. And, and that's that at, at one point might be one of the... the problems with the film there's so many characters yeah. to try and squeeze in yep. and explain and yep. put any context to i mean psylocke was great i mean olivia munn looked just like her from the comics yep but there really wasn't a lot of character there no you, you didn't really know she did cool stuff very little on screen time right when she was there she was usually punching whipping Swinging, stabbing, stabbing yes. someone. Yep. So that was pretty, pretty cool. You are introduced to Storm. Origin of Storm, a bit, a bit in this one. You are introduced to why Professor Xavier is bald. 
Yes. Which is very cool. Um, you are also introduced to Cyclops as well. And I think it's, uh, I can say this also, you are um, introduced to a moment in the X-Men universe that most comic book fans had been dying to see and had kind of seen before. And that is um, Barry Windsor Smith's kind of vision for the uh, Weapon X facility and what happened when Wolverine breaks out. Yep. Which is probably one of the highlights of this movie. And kind of comes out of nowhere. And I, I really honestly thought that you were going to see someone else. If you if you hadn't watched this, yeah. you were going to think you were going to see someone else play Wolverine. Right. And the fact that Hugh Jackman comes out. Again. Looks awesome. Killer. Just decimates the area that he's in in the most epic way possible. Right. And sets up really the very first X-Men movie. I mean, this sort of is the is what I would consider the true prequel to right. that very first X-Men movie. Sure. I can see um, that. You know, for sure. I think the standout cast member in this film was Quicksilver. Right. And I think they, whether intentionally or not, focused on him. His introduction in this film, obviously he was in the last film, but his introduction and the role that he plays... And several key, you know, points within the film right. is amazing. And the visuals that they take when he is running at speed. Quick and time. It, and everything is, is quick slow. Time, slow down, quick time. Is awesome. And it, there is a scene. Yeah. And it is. And I will tell you, if you're going to watch this in 4K UHD, it's, it's probably, you know, the scene that will uh, that that might make you actually buy all the equipment yeah. and dive in. Yeah, I this was so beautifully done. Just I mean, even on a non 4K screen, it's just beautiful. I mean, really thoughtful, amazing how it was filmed. He's, and, and did we explain what it was? He's basically saving people from an exploding X mansion. Yes, the mansion is exploding due to Cyclops at hitting um, a, a weapon reactor inside. So it wasn't Cyclops. It was Havoc, I think. Correct. Havoc, Correct. Right. Havoc. Um, and as a result, sets off a chain reaction, which, ex which explodes the mansion. And in real time, he sort of very cheerily <laughs> runs through. That's right. Picks people off. Throws, Including goldfish. Th throws them out the window, <laughs> drinks people's sodas. Right. Um, just sort of has a field day with it. Right. And it's such a fun scene, but it's it's one of those where you know it's amusing, but you just can't get over the fact of how visually awesome it is. Right. That, it's a jaw dropper. Yeah. Yeah. It's I think this this probably shows the true capabilities of four K. That that scene right there. And I don't know that anyone has come to that level yet, but it was very cool to watch. So detailed. Just the fire to too. Just, just awesome. the fire. Watching it anyway. Um, what else? You want to go over extras? Or you want to? I mean, we didn't even talk about really the plot. <laughs> the plot's kind of secondary <laughs> to some of the cool. Yeah, because it's just such cool a good setup movie. action going on. Right, apocalypse. He was in the comics for many a time. He's trying to take over the Earth and extinguish humanity and reshape the mutants so that they follow him in his paths. Yep, it's very cool. And his his horsemen, um, he assigns uh, Angel and Storm and Psylocke. Oh, and by the way, Nightcrawler, a young Nightcrawler, <laughs> another key. Really well done. And I thought the special effects on Nightcrawler was equally cool. Very cool. Yeah, the puffs of like. Blackish well, I mean, smoke. Let alone the the makeup that the makeup he's wearing, job which again. is which you know is is almost yeah similar to um, Jennifer Lawrence having to wear you know the the For rogue the rogue or no not rogue not um, rogue um, the the blue makeup for Mystique Mystique <sighs> and it's I mean and he's wearing it all the time. She's jumping back and forth between a normal form and 
and her mystique, but he is wearing He's stuck it with it all the time. That's right. Beast plays a pretty decent role yes. in this, and you really get that he was instrumental in sort of creating Professor Xavier's School for the Gifted. Right. He and was he, the guy behind the scenes. And he's very much behind the scenes. Um, so, yes, essentially you have this mutant, which I guess is the original mutant. And as Joe said, he is trying to cleanse the earth um, to bring it back into his image where everyone follows him and there's a soul leader. And there's a lots of, toward the end of the movie, massive scale chaos oh, happening. I mean, again, the visuals. Like ripping cities apart. Yeah, Magneto using the Earth's magnetic uh, yeah. field to create oh. just unbelievable chaos. and It's amazing. And I, I don't know where they, they go from here, whether they end up in the 90s, whether right. they just keep jumping decades, but... But so far, we should also mention the it made the least amount of money of the X Men, which makes no sense to me because I think of the three sort of prequel movies, this one, visually and story wise, was really solid. Um, tad long, I could have done away with a little bit. And you know what's funny is, it, it has this '80s vibe about it, but it's not a very obvious '80s vibe. And actually, there's deleted scenes in this, the extras package, that gives you even a better feel for the 80s vibe. And I wish they had actually put some of those scenes in. Well, there's stuff that's there. It's just very right. subtle, like Ronald Reagan's picture hanging up in in, uh, in the mansion. And, um, you know, to some extent, the vehicles that are being used. But, yeah, it's, it's subtle. There's a scene where um, Cyclops and the gang go to a mall. Yeah, and that's played out longer in an extended cut. Yep, and it's in an extended scene, and it really then really puts you into an '80s feel. But it's also one of these things where I do get the reasoning behind it because the '80s is really not a at all a a part of the story, right? Um, like the first one that had um, the Kennedy assassination, or the right, right, and the. Um, and the, well, in the second one, uh, Nixon was in the second one, right? Yep, right. So yeah, and yeah, now you have Reagan, and uh, no, I mean, I think, I don't, I think it was a, it was wasn't really a character that needed to be played out in the film itself, um, considering they had a lot of really high tech equipment for the eighties. <laughs> right, right. All right, extras. So. Uh, the director and uh, writer-producer Simon Kinberg have an optional commentary track, and these two guys are freaking geeks. There's no question about it. They're enthusiastic about what they're doing. Ton of information on the X-Men and the actors. Uh, some anecdotes, fun nuggets from the set. It's everything you'd want in an optional commentary track. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, too, with the deleted scenes and the extras, you could also turn on an optional commentary from Brian Singer. That's right. Which, which is which very, was helpful. Which is, in some ways, bizarre, because right. you don't see that. And I, the Singer points out to me, and I really didn't notice it, that Ali Sheedy, Breakfast Club's Ali Sheedy, was the teacher in a oh. scene in the movie. Oh, I didn't even catch that. Yeah, see? Yeah, hey there. And, uh... Oh, and just... He points out that the actor who played the blob, the blobs in the movie... <laughs> Is officially has the largest hands in the world, according to Guinness World Records. That's awesome. <laughs> so put that in your pipe and smoke it. Um, you know, it also includes a rap party video. Yeah, that is terrible. Which, which did you watch that? It's, I turned it on just, for novelty, and I was like, "Wow, this is a bunch of actors who get paid a lot of money sitting around high fiving each other for a job yeah. well done." There is there's a six part hour long production uh, featurette, really well done. And I get to hear some stuff from, uh, there's an interview with visual effects legend John Star Wars Dykstra. So that's really important to me. I enjoyed that a lot. Uh, they talk a lot about the ancient Egypt pyramids and how they did the effects and, and the German mutant fight club, which was a great scene. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, always, they get as, as stupidly detailed as that uh, Mr. McAvoy, as he was getting his head shaved, Patrick Stewart was watching him via FaceTime. Well, so that's another interesting. I mean, that's an iconic role that 
you that need, was you amazing. Need, you need to get signed off from from the original That's Professor right. Xavier. That's right. And we'll see Patrick Stewart again <sighs> as Xavier and in what the trailer looks to be an amazing Logan. film. That's correct. It is the last Wolverine yep. film that Hugh Jackman will be a part of. And he plays, reprises Professor Xavier sometime in the future. Right. He's somewhat senile. Yep. And it looks as raw and gritty as you hoped it would be. That's right. To take out, which I assume is the end for both of these guys. Right. Um, but it looks awesome, and I'm ready for it. So that'll be cool. That will be amazing. So X-Men Apocalypse, really, if you haven't seen it, and you're even a mildly interested mutant fan, you may need to see it. If you like action films, you need to see it. I think this beats out some of the like X-Men 3 I mean, this is a great oh, movie. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's way better than Kelsey Grammer and, and, as Beast and, 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 and X-Men. It, and it didn't get the love right. I think it deserves. This now, is, it's, now it's no Independence Day resurgence. Which, but yes, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. This is... It, this is in one minute. This is a Blu-ray that I think you should have yes. in your collection. It's a great movie. It's got a lot of cool stuff. It's great in 4K. It's fun. Oh, I'm sure of, they'll package this with the other two at some point. I'm sure <laughs> so, they will. Yeah. Um, but really well done. Great movie. Good effects. We didn't even talk about the villain, right? The villain is Oscar Isaac from the Star Wars. Right. Films. Which you would have no idea. Right. You really wouldn't. He no. does it's a great job. And the makeup the makeup really is good. Looks like the character from the comic book. Right. They do a great job capturing him there. But too. again, no signal whatsoever. That it's Oscar Isaac, right? At all, so except for in the very beginning. Oh, in, right when they're transferring when they're tra- when he's transferring his essence right. to another living being. Right, that's the only time you see it, and that's it. And it's what a minute, yeah. On and film, there, but there's so much crap going on. Yeah, as it happens, you're I, not even noticing his face. So. I didn't. I didn't really catch it until I watched the special features to be like, oh. There he is. Yeah, I right. totally forgot he's in this. That's cool. And he doesn't really have a major billing on it. It's sort of weird because you just don't know it's him. Right. Which is very cool. Um, very solid two thumbs up for me. Yep, me too. All right, when we come back, we will talk very briefly on Independence Day Resurgence. And and I'll do a little bit on Finding Dory that Sounds just great. came out this week. Sounds great. We'll be back. <laughs> Communities Digital News, built by the writers and editors that deliver the news 24 hours a day. Visit comdiginews.com. That's C-O-M-M-D-I-G-I news.com. And support the next evolution in news. Independence Day Resurgence did not have a resurgence for me no, at all. I was not resurged. No, I was not. They had too much time to think about it and tweak it and it's it, too much time in the cockpits for me and I mean, it fell flat okay first thing which you and i were just talking about before we came back was it's dark and not in the literal sense of boy this is a dark movie it's right. just i can't believe how dark it is no it's really dark it's hard to see things for the longest time i thought my tv was crapping out but you watched it in 4k I had the same problem. And you couldn't see anything either. Now, when it was light, it was great. Yes. But, but you know, I mean, if I want to see an orchid in a hospital room, it looked fantastic. <laughs> but that's not what I wanted to see. Yes. Um, I will be up front and say that I made it about 30 minutes into this. <laughs> that's I really sad. couldn't deal with how this like a four hour movie? ridiculously oh, no, hours, right? slow this was. And I just lost interest. The moon base was kind of cool. Yeah, I mean, but again, and, and just the, drag. These are well-loved, iconic characters that had nothing to do. Nope. They had nothing to do on they had screen. too many people. You, you, you had no established storyline for anyone. It was just like... Jump around, jump around, jump around. It was, it, you know, there was never a focus, a focus of anything. And... That's where it lost me. I could, I just couldn't get into it. I couldn't. There right. was no meat to cling to, because it was just all over the place. You do get to see more aliens. You do. 
You do get to see the wacky Dr. Brackish Orkin, Brent Spiner, who we now find out, much like Star Trek Beyond, he's he has a male partner. <laughs> Did you notice that? What? No, I didn't make it that far. Okay, he didn't even make it that far. But here's the thing. What I didn't Not under- that there's anything wrong with that. No, but what I want to know is, I thought he died in the first one. Well, he was in a coma. The alien put him in a coma. Okay. And then he woke back up. All right. In a hospital room with some very crisply detailed orchid orchids. Well, I mean, no. I will say the fact that we have adapted this alien technology to better defend ourselves, right. which turns out to be total BS, right? and they just come and lawnmower over the United States and every other country in the world and leave them exactly as they were 20 years ago, more or less. Right. And the premise of the film, you know, I know how the movie ends, obviously. The premise of the movie is very much just like the original movie. Someone sacrifices themselves, and all of a sudden, guess what? Right. We can win this thing. That's right. And you took a beloved character from the first movie, and you turned him into boring. Yes, that's the worst part of it. He There's was nothing boring. Yeah. And again, was, and there was no Will Smith. And he was depressing. Which even hurts. No, even and I think more. I think honestly, maybe he read the script for this and was like, "No way." Yeah. I mean. Not working. He's done sequels before, Men in Black. He's definitely done that. He's on for my, yeah. He'll do he'll do a sequel. Yeah, there's no problem there. I bet you he does a Suicide Squad sequel in a yeah, after that money for sure. Yeah. But no, this was rough for me. Um, it was very dark. It was just there was just a lot that you just couldn't get a hold of, and there was such a thin storyline. Other than you knew that they were going to come and destroy everything, and on the off chance. This movie made enough money, which we all know it didn't, to warrant a third film to complete the trilogy. The third film will take place on the alien planet as we attempt to invade it. Right. So Starship Troopers says. Right. Maybe if they do the third movie... They'll literally buy the rights to Starship Troopers yeah. and just and change the name, the whole thing. but leave the cast and the film intact, right? and that'll be the end of it. I doubt it. So what did you think of the extras? The extras. Okay, so once again, I love optional commentary tracks, and the um, director is there, Roland Emmerich. Um, you know, he did an okay job, and here's the problem, and I'd probably be much happier with it if it wasn't for the fact that I listened to the original optional commentary track for Independence Day, where uh, he was with his producing buddy, Dean Devlin, and those two were just gaga over the movie, so it was packed with information. This one, eh, not so much. Uh, there's a four-part documentary with a lot of cast and staff gushing about each other and how great the movie is. Uh, I preferred watching the five galleries of concept art only because it was interesting the way they turned some of these creatures and characters and ships Mm -hmm. and how they built ships and all that kind of stuff. That's interesting to me. My favorite extra, there's a three minute interview with author Julius Levinson. Okay. Played by, um, what's his name? Uh, la, 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 la. Uh, you don't even know. The guy from Taxi. Judd Hirsch? Judd Hirsch. It's a three-minute interview. You're going to like this. With a uh, Fa Albuquerque morning show host, played by Fred Armisen. Yes. Okay. And during the interview, Julius Levinson's son, Jeff Goldblum character, comes out, and those two talk to one another, goof on each other, you know, it's serious. But there's more character development there than that was in the entire movie. Three minutes. That's what I would watch. If you even rent the disc, do that. Just just don't. Okay. All right. 
Maybe the next one. Yeah. All right. All right. Where we're going next? We're going Finding Dory, and you're up on this one because okay, because you've never seen it, yeah, really. I don't know. I just... Do you want to wait on that? No. I, w- okay. I want you to provide your unbiased. Thirteen years later, we finally get the um, sequel to Finding Nemo, and it's set one year after, of course, they find Nemo in a dentist's office fish tank. You saw Finding Nemo, right? Yes, I think everyone has seen Finding Nemo. <laughs> okay, so the characters are voiced by the same people again, including Albert Brooks as Daddy Marlin, and Ellen DeGeneres as Dory. And the interesting, Dory's parent, the, the whole movie is about Dory having flashbacks. She's an absent-minded blue tang fish, and um, it's how she lost her parents and then the movie, we decide to see if she will find her parents, who are played by Eugene Levy and Diane Keaton. So that's big guns there. The best part of the movie, easily for me, was the introduction of an octopus who actually only has seven legs, uh, septipus, septipus maybe, uh, named Hank, played by uh, Married with Kids regular Ed O'Neill. He's funny, and and the. The Pixar animation of the octopus is unbelievable. Yeah. Stunning. Well. Stunning. And by the way, the whole high def experience, even though it's a Blu-ray and you're watching it upscaled on a 4K television, stunning. Like 3D without being 3D. Yeah, I'm assuming this one will probably not be true 4K because it's probably it's, was it, animated so long before it was released that... It will never, yeah. That I and Disney is not on board with 4K UHD yet. No, so they're not doing anything in 4K UHD. But it's a gorgeous um, port, digital transfer. Looks great. The one thing I will mention about the story: I was watching this with my wife, and she kept pointing out to me how they were basically uh, making fun of a disabled fish during during the movie. Dory really has a problem with her with remembering things and during the entire film it's about her getting busted on by other fish and things so that's kind of a bummer so kids need to parents need to think about that when they show it to their kids as well as the fact that there's these kind of scary flashbacks of dory getting taken away by for whatever reason and losing her parents and that's kind of Kind well, I mean, I feel like in the first movie it was pretty similar to that too, yeah. right? I mean, you had, you know, this situation where you had a kid who was taken, you know, via net. Right. And she was, you know, a big role in that film and was absent-minded. And they did, you know, subtly rip on her. And I that. don't know why it hit me, but it, but it did. Well, because she's more of the focus than in, in, yeah, in this movie. Yeah, she's completely the focus yeah. on this movie. Yeah. Um. It's a good movie, and you'll get to hear the voice of Sigourney Weaver again. And I won't say why or how, but you'll appreciate it. The extras are unbelievable. There's, like, way more than you'd ever need to know about Finding Dory. Optional commentary track. There's, um... Gag reels? (laughs) I don't think there's a gag (laughs) reel. 50 minutes of featurettes, right? And... Without a doubt, the coolest part of this movie, there is a six-minute uh, commuter animated short called Piper, and it is gorgeous. It's about a baby sandpiper leaving its nest, and it's animated, and it's so lifelike. So here's one question. Why do you think they put such an amazing amount of extras onto a DVD that's geared towards between 5 and 11-year-olds? Well, first, it was rated PG. Yeah, I mean, so, but still, five to eleven year olds are watching this. Because I, yeah, there's no way a five to eleven year old would be diving into a uh, nine minute look at Hank the Octopus from yeah. the digital animation side. So, what do you think the reason is for that? Because that's it's somewhat confusing to me. I mean, an adult is not going to love this movie so much that they're going to go and watch that. I mean, and, you, uh, you're doing an it. An adult who loves animation would. Yeah, maybe. But I don't know. It is a little odd to put that much stuff onto I, it. It's also convention. If like we're going to sell this to you, we're going to give you something. And Disney and Pixar are thankfully notorious. 
yes. for overloading you yep. with really great extras. Yeah, but but it, the extras didn't seem like there was a lot that was geared towards kids, except for the short. You know what? You're correct. There is not a lot for kids. The the weirdest thing in the um, I want to make sure this is right. There, there is like six hours, and that's what I'm saying. Six hours of living aquariums. Okay, you you can you can like Put set on your, your TV, TV yep. and you can watch a um, stingray migration for like two hours. Now, the only problem I had with that, and that would probably be the child piece of the entire thing, or for like a party or a birthday party. Yeah, um, it's a loop. Instead of like mm. giving you two hours of a uh, Oh. Of like randomness, it's happening. So how long is the loop? Oh, it's like not good. Ten minutes. Like the stingray migrations, about thirty seconds to sixty seconds. And oh, they just loop it for two hours. Yeah. Oh. See, that made no sense to me, and and that was maybe my the only thing that like made me go, boy, why would they even waste the time? If you consider where animation is now, and the randomness, and the ability to do stuff like that yeah. where you can literally just tell a computer set an algorithm to do to do and create like that yeah why would they do that i don't know but and, once again unless it was some executive who just thought you know what let's put a screen saver on this thing let's do it finding dory has made over a billion dollars yep this is like the animated movie yep and i can't imagine they're gonna wait another 10 years to do another one to do another one no there's no I, way i wouldn't think but anyway it is a good movie it's a very family friendly fun movie just watch your kids as you're as you're watching it to see that they don't especially the ones that are uh sus- suspect to something like that that might be a little freaked by parental loss or something like mm-hmm. that there's no deaths or anything staggering in this but it's a good movie yeah, i mean it's a disney movie it's got heavy undertones it's Definitely got heavy undertones. For sure. So. I think we're good. We're good? We're caught up. I am Todd Stowell. I am, I said, Joseph Zadkowski. Thank you. This has been the Zadzooks Happy Hour. Now Polka Infused. Absolutely. That's right. Thank you. Let's go. Thank you, Todd. <laughs>